God's given us a biblical manual here because the reality is as we learn about Jesus and we learn about God's way of doing stuff, our goal being to learn how to handle conflict God's way, to learn to fight fair, and to learn how to forgive. That's today's message. As we learn to do it God's way, it's going to be very different than the world's way. In fact, there are going to be things today that you're going to read and you're going to see from the scriptures and you go, whoa, never thought about that. And you know what? The Holy Spirit's going to help us get where we need to go. Let's walk through this because we need it. You know, I, um, I've known the rules for a while now. I've known that many in our church maybe have never heard the rules. And I say, God, when do I need to give that message? Because, God, your timing is the right timing, not my timing. And you know what God told me? Because this pain that I talk about, it happened several years ago now. But the reality is, um, he said, you ain't preaching that message yet. I said, God, what do you want me to do? And you know what he did? He said, go to the book of Genesis and go through the entire book of Genesis. You know how long that took me? There's 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. So all last year, that's all we do is just go through Genesis. And I said, now what do you want me to do? And he said, go to the book of Matthew. So we're like, we're in June now, right? We're almost in June. We've been in Matthew since the beginning of the year. And today of all days, about 68 weeks later, he said, now's a good time to have that message. Because it's his timing and not my timing. So what are the rules of biblical conflict? What are we supposed to be doing? We're in Matthew chapter 18. We did the first 14 verses last week. We're going to go verses 15 through 35 today. Here's the rules. And listen, it's important that we learn them and that we abide by them. This is huge. It says, if your brother or sister sins, you go and you point out their fault just between the two of you. Meaning, you don't go to everybody else and tell them what you think about the situation or about the person, you go directly to that person and you have a conversation with them. Now, our world has actually conditioned us to learn how to not do communication very well by adding more communication avenues. It's kind of interesting. We got text messaging and Instagram and Facebook and email and all these things that have pulled us away from a phone. We ain't gonna have a phone call anymore we got all these other methods. And then we've kind of been conditioned to keep our mind and attention focused on our computers and our devices and our iPads and our screens. That now, when I grew up, there was a bunch of kids outside with a bunch of bicycles and skateboards laying everywhere in everybody's yard. And mine was in some neighbor's yard six houses down the road. It's just what we did. And there were water hoses that we drank from and things that we did. And people were outside. Nowadays, you can't find a kid outside, Harley. It's just different world that we live in. Things are different because friendship and communication and learning how to just talk to one another has kind of gone away. We've forgotten how to do that, and it's not good. So the Bible says you got a problem with somebody who sins against you. You're supposed to go to them one-on-one. You ain't supposed to talk about this issue with anybody else. You're supposed to go directly to them and talk to them about it. Just between the two of you, and if they listen to you, it says... According to the Bible, you've won them over. This is a good thing. We've won. Jesus gave us two options when a person sins against us. We can go to them directly and deal with it, or we can just drop the matter under Christian long-suffering and bearing with one another. Because the Bible talks about bearing with one another a lot in the Scripture. It talks about long-suffering. Sometimes we just go, you know what, I'm just going to drop it and let it go. It's long-suffering. We bear with one another because nobody's perfect. The other options like holding on to bitterness, retaliation, gossiping to others about the problem, say it with me, are not allowed. These are the rules of the game. And you go, well, pastor, you don't know what happened to me, and let me sit down and tell you the da 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 Here's the reality. I can't change the church manual or the church handbook. Here's why. Because the Bible is our handbook. And I didn't write it. I just follow it. And so it doesn't matter how I feel about it. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It's God ordained. This is the handbook that the church 
capital C church. Every church should be following this right here. And if they're not, they're, not, they're, they're living in sin. They're not doing it God's way. This is God's way. Charles Spurgeon, the great theologian pastor, said, We must seek out the offender and tell him his fault as if he were not aware of it, as perhaps he may not be. <laughs> you know, sometimes we offend people with some things that we say, and we don't even know that we said something that made them mad. We have no idea that we even, it's like, really? I didn't even, uh, where if we would go back to communication and say, hey, when you said this thing, I took it like this. And I don't know if you meant it to be that way, but this is kind of how I took it. Did you mean it to be that way? And that gives them the opportunity to say, yeah, I meant to call you a jerk. <laughs> or, no, I didn't mean that like that. And I had no idea that that, that landed that way. I am so sorry that what I said caused this pain. I had no idea. He says, go to the person as if he were not aware that he even caused the problem because he might not even be knowing that he caused the problem. That's why one-on-one -on -one is critical. The Bible said you will win him over when you do that. You've won him over in two ways. First, the problem's been cleared up. Hey, miscommunication, bro. Glad we solved that. Now we're good. We're not living in pain. Perhaps you realized that he was right in some ways, and maybe he realized you were right in some ways, but overall, the problem's resolved, so this is good news. We've gone one-on-one, -on -one, we've done it God's way. Second way that you've won this person over is because you've not wronged your brother or sister by going to others with gossip and half the side of a dispute. So you're winning either direction by doing it God's way. Wouldn't it be nice if people wouldn't gossip about you when something happens? Who thinks that would be a pretty good idea? Then, well, okay, the rest of you, I don't know what's wrong with you. I have no idea. What, I'm praying for you, right? No idea why you think that's okay. But when you say, yeah, it would be great if people would stop gossiping. This would be a good thing. Well, you just agree with God's rule number one. When there's a conflict, we ain't going to gossip about anybody. We're going to go deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. Now, there's more. But if they won't listen to you when you go one-on-one, -on -one, he says, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Let's bring some other people into this conversation. Now, when you bring another person into the conversation, and as a church, guys, again, a lot of pain was caused for me because the church didn't understand the rules. And today we get to learn the rules of the conflict. How do we fight fair? How do we do it God's way? I was in deep pain through a situation, and part of what needs to happen when you go through step one and you get nowhere, you've tried and you just can get nowhere, the Bible says take two or three people with you to try to talk it out. And the two to three people that are the witnesses, they're there to mediate, and they're there to kind of judge the matter and to give wisdom and to give counsel. Now, you don't just take your best friend in the church with you to go and have this confrontational meeting. What you do is you say, who's the neutral party in our lives? Who's the one that I love and trust within the church body and that this person loves and trusts within the church body? Because we're going to fight fair. Somebody say, fight fair. We've got to learn the, the rules of engagement. You fight fair. You say, I find the neutral party that we both love and trust, and if that person tells either of us anything, we need to listen to them. So you take the two or three with you and you say, here's our issues and here we're going to talk it out. And then we have to learn to trust the information of the person that's there to mediate. What would happen if we did life this way instead of the way that we normally do it? Well, it would be a lot different. But we need to be aware that it's also true that the one or two more that you bring in to judge with us, after hearing both sides of the story, they may resolve the issue by assigning responsibility differently than the first offended person had thought. Because <laughs> the Bible says, in a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and then cross-examines. Information can sound really right when it's the first thing you've heard. I can't believe that. I know everything that happened. You don't know anything that happened until you hear both parties. You can't know until you have all the information. You don't have enough information. 
So sometimes you'll go and you'll think, this is the way it's going to be. They're going to set them straight. And those two or three mediators are going to go, actually, hey, man, right here, I think you're, you're holding a little bit of an offense. And I wish I had a physical fence that I could just hold. Because some people walk around with what we call an offendable spirit. And it's a spirit of offense. That it doesn't take very much to offend you. Somebody says a little bitty thing that should just roll off your shoulder and not even be a thing. And all of a sudden it's a massive thing in your life because you're holding a fence. And today I hope that you'll put the fence down. We don't need to hold on to a fence. We need to let go of a fence. So in a lawsuit, the first speak seems right until there's a cross-examination. Those two or three might look and go, hey, I know that this caused you hurt and pain, but the reality is, Sometimes we need somebody, and again, it, this is the person that we love and trust, the neutral party. When your neutral party says, hey, I think you might have a little victim mentality going on. Hopefully you can hear from your person that you say you love and trust. By the way, if you have nobody in your life that you think that you can love and trust, you need to pray on why you feel the way that you do. Because it's not right that there's nobody around you that you can love and trust. There's something going on in your heart that needs to be dealt with. There are people that you should be able to build a relationship with that love you and that you love them and that we can trust one another. There needs to be. And if there's not, there's a heart thing going on that needs to be dealt with. I encourage you in that. The goal in biblical conflict resolution must be, church, it must be, the restoration of relationship. That's the goal. If we're meeting together to beat somebody up, that's wrong. The goal must be that we're here to try to restore the relationship more than proving that you were the one that was right. Hey, everybody look, look. I'm a human being, and you're a human being. And sometimes we can let matters that happen Come in between this human being and that human being. And we're human beings. And God wants us to live in love and unity together. He wants us to work together and respond together and love on one another through issues. But if one person's goal is restoration, the other person's goal is to be right, it makes it very difficult to do that. The good news is I'm not aware of any conflict within our church. This is awesome. So I get to preach Matthew 18 right now and preach the rules of engagement and go, hey, next time there's an issue, next time there's a problem, the expectation for all of us will be we go one-on-one. -on -one. If, we, if we're wrong, let's admit our wrongs. Let's ask for forgiveness. Let's get it figured out. Let's move forward. Let's not gossip about each other. Hey, if you go one-on-one -on -one and it ain't work, then you take the two or three more with you. And we have to respect the decisions of the people we've brought into the room to mediate with us and to help us through conflict. Verse 17. If they still refuse to listen. So we're sitting there, and the first person did wrong, and you went one-on-one. -on -one, they ain't listening to you. You bring two or three in, and they ain't listening to none of the information. They are still, like, unrepentant about it. He says, then you tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to either, even the church, you treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, before we move into what that means... And we're going to unpack what that means to give you full depth understanding because I'm going to tell you from personal experience that I've walked with people through step one, through step two, through step three. And that required a one-on-one, -on -one, a one-on-four, and a one-on-18. And because the church body as a whole didn't do this last part, Again, it caused me so much deep pain that I wanted to quit my job and do anything else. Didn't even care what it was. It's important that we all work together to follow the scriptures. I don't fault anybody in the church. I really do believe that people do things because they don't know the scriptures. <laughs> so today, we all get the ground rules. And now that we have them, we're going to be able to walk forward stronger together in understanding what to do. Let's talk about what does this mean? Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Well, the word pagan means to be somebody who's not even a believer. They're not a Christian. Okay? So what are our options? Well, there's two sides to it. 
There's two sides, and they're opposite of each other. So let's, let's go. The unrepentant one must be treated as you would a heathen and a tax collector. First, with great love. Everybody say love. They have to be treated with great love. With the goal of bringing about a full repentance and reconciliation. You know that lost people that are not Christians, we have a love for lost people. And we have a goal that we want them to have full repentance for their sin, and we want them to have reconciliation with God their Father. So when he says you treat them as you would a heathen or a tax collector, he's saying you treat them with love, and you're praying for their full repentance and a full reconciliation. That's the first side of the coin. On the flip side of the coin, one is to be guarded like a heathen and a tax collector. There's a sense on the other side of being refused what we call full standing and full participation in the body of Christ, in the church. This is actually what Paul was meaning in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read it to you. And by the way, when I read 1 Corinthians 5, you're going to go, whoa. Because that's what I did when I read it. I was like, wow, that's pretty strong. And a lot of times you see people within the church, they, they do the one side really well. We're going to love on them. We just care about them. And you're right, we do, and we should. But if you don't do this other side of the coin that comes along with it, it really does mess everything up and causes a lot of pain for everybody. And it it debacles the whole church. Here's what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 5 about being refused some full standing with other believers in church. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now that right there in and of itself is like, don't associate with sexually immoral people. Whoa, that's... How would we do that? Because the world's pretty bad. Well, let's keep reading. He says, I'm not at all talking about the people of this world, by the way. In other words, people who are not believers, people who are not Christians, he says, I'm not talking about them, the people of this world, who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd actually have to leave this world, (laughs) okay? Because there's no way to get away from all that. In fact, it would be anti-gospel, Bible, anti-God to say, I'm going to stay away from all the people in the world because they're sinners. That's the exact opposite message. He's saying, I'm not at all meaning stay away from all these people who are sexually immoral, have all these problems that are not Christians. Look at verse 11. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, but is acting sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slander, a drunkard, or a swindler. And then he says, do not even do what? Don't even eat with such people. Somebody go, that's hardcore right there. Paul, Paul ain't playing around in the church. And he's, he's given our church a handbook and a model, and he's saying, listen, if they're unbelievers, we win them to Christ so they can be reconciled to God. We love on them, and we pray for their repentance. He says, if you've gone step one with them, step two with them, step three with them, you need to love them and pray for their reconciliation and repentance, but you also need to let them know that as a church body in unison together we're saying we can't even eat with you until you get this made right our church went through a situation where people didn't do that and it broke everything up and it caused me a deep amount of pain again I don't think it's anybody's fault I don't think we knew the rules of the game but I, I pray with all my heart that going forward, if we ever run into a conflict like a one, two, three, that we'll work together like we should. And we'll do what God's word says. See, the message that should be sent to the unrepentant one is a message of, say this word, discipline. Now, I know we're in 2024 and we go, can we discipline nowadays? Well, maybe that's a little bit of what's wrong with our world is we don't discipline. 
I'll get a couple claps in there. I know what you believe about discipline, but I'll tell you this. Um, if, if I tell my kids, hey, you need to bring your grades up, and, and you need to bring it to this standard right here, and I say, if you don't get your grade up by this period of time, I'm going to ground you for a month. And, you know, they don't, they don't get their grade up, and I say, son, unfortunately, I'm going to have to ground you for a month. This is the, the penalty for not meeting the expectation. When you don't do that, you got to go through some discipline, right? But if mom comes along behind and says, um, hey, it's been two days. And we love you. We just love you so much. Let's go to lunch together and we'll talk about your life. And you know, it's not good what's been happening. And you know what? It was, a, it was a great lunch. I'm going to lift the band off of you. I'm not going to ask you if that's ever happened in your life. But do you see the problem with that? When you say this is the discipline and this is the expectation, but you don't live up to the discipline and the expectation, what happens is the person doesn't feel any pain. When you feel no pain, you continue to do whatever you want to do because there ain't no reason not to because everybody's going to love on me and participate with me and do all that. And you know what? When the church operates like that and we, we want to show love, listen, I want to show love. There's no reason I don't want to show love. But whenever we don't operate like that and half of us go, hey, we need to make sure that we abide by this. And the other half go, no, 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 we're just going to go be friends. Da, 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 da. We care more about that. Listen, you're playing by a different set of rules and you're cheating. And guess what? You're causing us great pain. According to the Bible, here's a strong statement. If we care about the rules anymore. I hope we do. I hope we'll do it God's way. Because God's way is the best way. God's way is the plan of no gossip. God's way is the plan of repentance and reconciliation. And God's the God of love and forgiveness to all of us. That's God's plan. And if we operate God's way, it works. Now let me show you these three verses because this is where he goes through the, like, here's the roadmap: Step one, step two, step three. But then he gives us these three verses that seem pretty weird right here. And we oftentimes use these verses. When we're praying together, we say, we're two or more gathered in my name. He's in our midst. It's one of the verses. But when you understand the context of where those verses fit, he's talking about it right after there's been biblical conflict within the church. When there's a dispute between two parties, he gives us these three verses about prayer and unity. He says this, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And I go, God, why are these three verses right here? And I start digging. In Greek, the word agree means to symphonize. Jesus wants us to complement each other like a great orchestra. We are to be a number of musical instruments that are set to the same key and playing the exact same tune. Can you imagine if our instrumentalist got up here and said, well, I want to play this song right now, and somebody else up here said, I want to play this song right now, and somebody else said, I want to play this song right now, and they all just started playing at the exact same time. It would be a chaotic mess. And it would sound terrible, and we would all want to get away. That's what would happen. But to agree means to symphonize, same tune, same key, same song. It's a perfect agreement of our hearts, desires, wishes, and voices of two or more people praying to God. Now let's walk it out. We've had a brother or sister offend us, and we've gone one-on-one, it didn't work. And then we brought two or three people in the room, and it didn't work. And then we took it to the church And that didn't work. When we are, as a body of believers, praying, what do you think the tune should be that we're praying for all at the exact same time? What should we be praying for? Reconciliation. What else? Repentance. What else? Forgiveness. If the church body says, hey, we've had a step one, a step two, and a step three happen. We need everybody singing the same song. Not mom's going to lift the band after two days, 
and dad's going to say we need to be grounded for a month. We all need to be saying the exact same thing, unified, so that way the person that's in that repentance area understands, wow, I've lost something that I love. I've lost my church family that I desperately need. And if we all play the exact same way, what ends up happening is that person goes, I need to get this right. And repentance and reconciliation can then be walked out and it can take place and forgiveness can happen and the body of Christ can be strengthened. Can you imagine if no, no church ever had a, a break and they all just kept growing and growing and growing and growing and growing? Wouldn't it be awesome if everybody was together and unified? And he says, pray in the same tune together. So we've got this progression, biblical conflict. Church, let's all pray towards reconciliation and forgiveness and love and forgiveness. Then Peter says, one of the disciples comes to Jesus. He says, Lord, hey, while we're on this topic, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And then he, he's got this moment where he wants to sound really spiritual. And so he says, up to seven times should I do it? And the reason that would sound spiritual is because Peter, in light of what Jesus said about agreement and unity, he hoped to sound extremely loving by suggesting forgiving a repentant brother or sister up to seven times. Why was it spiritual sounding? Because three times was the ex accepted limit taught by many of the Jewish rabbis. Like the rabbis would say, hey, it's one, two, three strikes, you're out. And that's the ball game, right? And so Peter says, well, man, I'm not going to just double it. I'll add one more to it. We'll say seven times. Jesus, do I have to forgive my brother up to seven times? He's like, geez, going to pat me on the back. I'm doing a good job, man, a good A student right now. And Jesus answered him. And he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And Jesus is like, 77 times. Some translations actually translate it to say 70 times seven, which is like 490. But think about it back in the day. If I just told you, uh, you know, 70 times seven, you're like, what is that? Give me a calculator. Oh, yeah, we don't have any calculators. Give me a stone tablet. I've got to figure this out, right? 70 times 7. They're trying to figure out how much is it? 490, right? Jesus was trying to be absurd in his response. He was trying to say, I want you to forgive 70 times 7. I want you to, your head to explode with the ability of, I can't even calculate how much I'm supposed to forgive because it's just so much I need to forgive. Which tells us that this forgiveness thing is a really big deal to God. Because he could have said four times, but he didn't. He said, I'm going to give you something that you go, could I ever get there and do that? That many times, for real? That many times. Which means, he doesn't want you walking around today with anger and bitterness and unforgiveness in you. He doesn't want that for you. He wants more for you. His best is not that you're weighed down with that. He wants you set free of that. And the only way to get set free of that is to forgive the person that hurts you. It's the only way. See the progression. Conflict. Pray for unity, reconciliation, repentance, and forgiveness. Jesus, how many times do we need to forgive? Up to seven? No, dude. So much more than that that you wouldn't believe it. More than you even think. Seventy times seven. He's like, how much is that? I can't even. That's the point. You can't even figure it out. Just keep, you're just going to keep forgiving. There's no limit to the forgiveness. Then, I'm trying. Nobody's listening. Is it good? It's the scripture. Isn't it so good? I love reading the word. The word speaks to me. I'm like, man, that's so good. I, I love that you're enjoying it. Thank you for saying that too. It encourages me. Jesus sometimes, he tries, um, he doesn't try. He successfully ever times, every time, gives us a picture so we can remember better. Some people are auditory learners and they can hear a truth, but sometimes if you got a picture, it just is like, boom, now I see it. And he, he, he wants them to remember this conversation about forgiveness, and so he gives them a little picture at the back end. He says, let me tell you a story. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who decided he wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 
bags of gold. He, he didn't owe him 10,000 pieces of gold. He owed him 10,000 bags of gold. This is extravagant. This is too much. We can't even compute how much this man truly owed. 10,000 bags of gold was an exorbitant amount that this guy, let's be honest, 10,000, he's never going to be able to repay this 10,000 bags of gold debt that he owes. It's too much. This man was brought to him to settle accounts. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had had to be sold to repay the debt. Since you'll never be able to repay this debt, I'm going to take you and you're going to become a servant and you're going to do whatever you're told the rest of your life because this debt is more than you can pay and this is the best that you can offer me is I'm just going to take everything you've got and you're going to follow everything I say. That's pretty strong. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will repay back everything. Which wasn't true, because he could never really pay back that. It's too big of extravagant of an amount. But his heart is, I'll pay back, have mercy on me. The servant's master took pity on him. And check it out. He canceled the debt and he let him go free. Wow. Let me, let me, let me modernize this in a way that a lot of you guys will get. Um, some of y'all have been praying for that student loan forgiveness to come through. Because <laughs> you got a debt on you that's too big for you and you can't pay it. And you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how to pay that. And you've been praying prayers like you've never prayed before in your life. you got bigger prayer life today than you've ever prayed. God, please help this go through so that I can get my loan forgiven, that my debt can be canceled. It's the exact same principle. He owed 10,000 bags of gold, more than he could ever repay. And this man said, I'm going to have mercy on him, and I'm going to let him go and set him free. But the story's not done. Lean in. Verse 28 says this. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. Far less. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. He said, just be patient with me. And I'll pay it back. By the way, this was a debt, 100 coins. He could have paid it back. He just needed a little time, a little bit of mercy, a little bit of grace, a little bit of that word called love. But this man refused. Instead, he went off and he, he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they're standing around watching this whole thing go down, they were outraged, and they went and they told their master everything that had just happened. They went back to that first guy. You're not going to believe what that guy left and did. You forgave him of 10,000 bags of gold that he owed. You set that man. You're not going to believe. Let me tell you a story of what he did. They saw clearly what was wrong. Charles Spurgeon, he said, others could see the evil of his contact, uh, conduct even if he could not. It was pretty obvious that they go, that's absurd that that guy would go choke that man. That's absurd that he was forgiven us so much and he can't forgive a hundred silver coins. Are you kidding me? That's absurd. They could see it, even if that guy couldn't. Verse 32, then the master called the servant in, called him back. Hey, I got to come, come back. We're talking again. You wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owes. Now before we go, that's right. How dare that guy? Unreal. Pastor, preach it. This justice served. Judge Janine, you know. <laughs> That's justice served. Before we, before we go there, there's one more verse. This is how my heavenly Father 
will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Ouch. This principle is really clear. God has forgiven such a great debt that any debt owed to us, guys, it's absolutely insignificant in comparison. No man can possibly offend me to the extent that my sins have offended my God. My debt was too heavy. There's no way I could ever get it right. This principle must be applied in the little things done to us, but also to the great things done to us. Church, the goal of this message today is to learn to handle conflict God's way, to learn to fight fair, to play by the rules, and to forgive. And it's not just in word forgiveness. The Bible was very clear. We do that from our heart. You haven't forgiven until you've forgiven from your heart. Here's some practical application as we close down. Number one, go directly to the person who offends you. Go directly to them. Don't talk to anybody else. Number two, if you don't resolve the matter, take one or two people with you and try again. Try again. And admit, fighting fair is I'm going to find somebody that lo- I love and respect and somebody that you love and respect, and we're going to mediate this, and we're going to trust the wisdom of our brother or sister. Not going to then get mad at them for not agreeing with us. We might have a heart issue if that's the case. Number three, if that doesn't work and the person is in the wrong, then you got to take it to the church. You got to bring it up to the church. More people get involved. Number four, if that doesn't work, what do we do? Don't associate with that person. Number five, he says, choose to forgive so God continue to bless you. And there's a lot of people that you've been hurt and there's been pain, but you never forgave. And so God can't open up the windows of heaven to bless you in your life. And today, I hope that you leave here different than the way that you came. Resolve some of this issue that's going on. And then number six, we have to remember that forgiven people forgive. How could I ever, knowing that I've offended God so much, withhold forgiveness from anybody? How could I ever? And by the way, how could you ever? You can't. You've already been forgiven of so much. So let's take it to God. Would you bow your heads in prayer? You say, Pastor, man, this message has hit me. <laughs> this message is speaking to me right now. If that's you and you've got some, some conflict resolution that needs to be dealt with, I want to pray for you. If you're walking through this right now, you got some conflicts that need to be dealt with and you're, you want to do it the right way. If that's you, would you just raise your hand, take it right back down. See your hands going up all over the place. You can take it right back down. Thank you for your honesty. How many of you go, you know what, I, I've got some unforgiveness I need to deal with. Would you take your hand up and put it right back down? I'm going to pray for you. What I want to do is I want to lead you right now through some prayer time. Okay, would you take a moment and choose to forgive. Maybe if you're going through some conflict, you ask God for some wisdom right now. So just pray and say, God, give me wisdom on how to take some next steps. It's going to take courage. It's going to take communication. It means you've got to actually go get in a room with somebody and talk to them. You don't really want to do it, but it's God's way, so you need to do it. Pray for that. You got somebody you need to forgive. I want to get that anger and unforgiveness and bitterness off you right now. And here's how we'll do it. Okay, I want to lead you through the prayer. So repeat after me right where you're seated. You don't even have to do it out loud. You can if you want, but just mean it from your heart. That's the point. You're going to say this. You're going to say, God, I forgive. Now I want you to take a moment with God and name the people that came to your mind that you need to forgive. Start releasing them out of that little prison you got them in in your heart. Forgive them. God, I forgive and name them. You're going to feel a weight come off of you immediately as you set those people free. Now say this. Say, Holy Spirit, 
Fill me with your presence. Thank you for releasing me of bitterness and anger. Let me live for you, God. In Jesus' name. Would you look up to the screens real quick? No matter what we do, we realize that there are people in the room for the very first time. And they've never been to a church, perhaps. And today, we're talking about relationship with God and having a relationship. And maybe you go, I don't really know if I even have a relationship with God. Here's what you need to know. Jesus loved the world so much that he died on a cross. And he did that to pay the price of sin, to forgive us of the debt that we can't pay for ourselves. It's more than we could owe. They buried him in a tomb, but three days later, he rose back to life to prove to you, me, and the entire world that he is God and he is worth following And his teachings and his truths are transformational when you invite God to be a part of your life. So your starting point today is to ask him for forgiveness for your sin. That he went to the cross for you, that you accept what he did for you, and that you invite him into your life. And this is the prayer you can pray to do that. So if you feel led to pray, repeat after me. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. Let's welcome people into the family of God today, church. If you just prayed that prayer, text the word new me with no spaces to the number on the screen. I'm going to send you some more information about the prayer you prayed and give you next steps to following Jesus with your life and growing in in your walk with God. That being said, if you're a first time guest, a second time guest, or one month guest, go out to our lobby and let us know, hey, I'm a first time guest or whatever. And we're going to give you some swag, some things to take home with you, some gifts that we want to put in your hand. There's a free t-shirt we want to give to you. That's our jersey and our way of saying, hey, welcome to the family of God and welcome to the team. We're glad that you're a part. So make sure you get that on your way out. And I want to encourage you to do what we call the Stick Six Challenge. Come and get a full picture of what we're all about at Revolution Church. It's hard to get to know each other in just one visit. So if you give us some more opportunity, we'll get to know you and you'll get to know us. That being said, we're going to say goodbye to our online campus on the count of three. Help me out. One, two, three. Goodbye.